right, we're going to be continuing our study in the book of 1 Samuel. We're at chapter 5 today, and you should have a handout there that has the text that we'll be going over today, as well as some fill-in-the-blanks uh, for, uh, for the takeaways at the end. Do you have those? Can somebody stick a hand out the window and say we have those? I'll say, excellent, wonderful. I just wanted to make sure that you had those this morning. Well, just to give you the backstory, in case maybe you're visiting with us this morning or in case uh, you've missed a, 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 ser a sermon or two, uh, these are going to be available on YouTube as well. Uh, we're going through the book of 1 Samuel, and it happens at the end of the period of the judges. Samuel is the last judge of Israel before we get into the kings, uh, King Saul being the first king, then David and Solomon. So uh, Samuel is the last uh, of the judges. Uh, it is uh, probably happening about the same time as the story of Ruth. Many scholars feel that Samuel probably wrote uh, the book of Ruth as well. Uh, the book of Samuel in, in the Hebrew canon, my understanding is it's only one uh, large book, uh, begun by Samuel, but obviously completed by someone else since uh, Samuel dies uh, midway through. But uh, this, is the, this is his account of, of how Israel transitioned from uh, the era of the judges to the era of the kings. And so they've escaped Egypt, they've uh, conquered the land, uh, they escaped with Moses, they conquered the land with Joshua, then judges ruled over them for a certain period of time. And, and if you've ever read through the book of Judges, it, it was a time that the scripture says where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Uh, and, and when everybody does what is right in their own eyes, it's just absolute chaos. And so they descended into these cycles of chaos where they would sin against God, where they would stop following the law, and then uh, God would send affliction upon them. They would cry out to God, repent of their sins. God would send them a deliverer. And as long as that judge or that deliverer lived, uh, usually they had peace and prosperity until that cycle repeated itself yet again. And so uh, that's kind of how the story unfolds is that we're right at the end of that, that season. Uh, there is a priest whose name is Eli. Uh, he has uh, two sons, uh, Hophni and Phinehas, who are wicked men serving as priest. And Samuel comes into their family uh, because he is dedicated to the Lord. His mother has asked for a child and has consecrated that child to the Lord. She said, God, if you'll give me a, a son, I'll give him back to you. And so she, she brought Samuel at a very young age to the temple to live and serve there at the temple, uh, or not at the temple, but at the tabernacle. And so uh, he is serving there and uh, he brings a prophecy against Eli and his household because of their wickedness. And we covered uh, some of that last week. And so one of the things that happened is they had this great, this great battle and against the Philistines and they, they lost in battle. And so the next day they said, well, what we'll do the next day is we're going to bring in the God box. We're going to bring in the Ark of God. And it will fight for us, and we will win the battle, but it didn't go that way. And they, in fact, lost the battle, and the Ark of God was captured by the Philistines. And right at the end of, of chapter 4, uh, there's this despairing story of this child named Ichabod who was born, and it means God's presence or God's glory has departed. But God is about to manifest His glory in a different way uh, among the Philistines, and that's where the story picks up in chapter 5. So chapter 5 and verse 1, Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Ashdod is one of their five uh, primary cities. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon, and they set it by Dagon. Now my understanding is that Dagon uh, had the appearance of what you might think of as uh, King Neptune, or this half-mermaid kind of looking deity. He's, he's got a fish uh, torso and tail and a uh, man's upper body and so this is he there's this statue to Dagon there and they bring the ark of God and they set it right beside of this statue of Dagon as if to say our God has beaten your God and when the people of Ashdod arose in the morning there was Dagon fallen on his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord and that had to be a pretty impressive sight. This statue is, is falling on its face before the ark. And it's, it's God's way of just saying, don't, don't put me next to Dagon, okay? Uh, in fact, that's the second commandment. Have no other gods before me. So they took Dagon and, and set him back in his place. They, they excused it. There must have been some kind of earthquake. You know, something must have happened that, that has knocked our statue off of its pedestal. Uh, it's going to be okay. So they set Dagon back in his place again. 
When they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. The head of Dagon and both of the palms of his hands were broken off uh, on the threshold only. Dagon's torso was left of it. Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor anyone who came to Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. So, so God has sent a message, a preliminary message to the Philistines that he is far more powerful than their false god, Dagon, and has caused this statue to fall over now two evenings in a row. And you have to think that there had to be some panic. Remember, the Philistines knew the stories. They knew about the Egyptians. They knew about Jericho. They knew the stories of how God had delivered the children of Israel. And so uh, now they're beginning to, to wonder, was this a wise idea? And it, look at verse six and it says, but the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod. And he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how it was, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us. For his hand is harsh toward us and Dagon our God. Therefore, they sent and gathered themselves all the lords of the Philistines and said, what shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, let the ark of God be carried away to Gath. This is one of the other five primary cities. And, and maybe, this, maybe they didn't have a temple to Dagon there, and they thought they needed to put some distance between their God and, and, and the God of Israel. So they carried the ark of God of Israel away. And so it was, after they had carried it, that the hand of the Lord was against the city with very great destruction. And he struck the men of the city, both small and great, and tumors broke out on them. Therefore, they sent the ark of God to Ekron, then the next city. And so it was when the ark of God came to Ekron that the Ekronites cried out, saying, They have brought the ark of the God of Israel to us to kill us and our people. So they sent and gathered all the lords of the Philistines, and said, send away the ark of God of Israel and let it go back to its own place so that it does not kill us and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. For the hand of God was very heavy there. And the men who, knew, who did not die were stricken with tumors and the cry of the city went up to heaven. Well, that's a strange story, isn't it? It's kind of a fun story. Uh, I've thought that the, the Philistines must be rednecks because whenever the, the, their uh, idol fell, they all said, Dagon it. Oh, yeah, I got a few laughs. I could actually hear a few. That was my dad joke for the day. Dagon it. That's where it came from was the Philistines. Well, what's the takeaway from this amazing account? The first is this. And it's a serious one. There is an incompatibility between light and darkness. They can't, as the bumper sticker says, coexist. Light and darkness can't exist together. They're incompatible. The scripture says that light came into the world and the darkness comprehended it not. They're at war with each other, light versus darkness, good versus evil, God versus Satan. There is an incompatibility here. We can't dwell in the shadow, in other words. We can't, we can't find some place in the middle and say, well, I, I kind of want to be in the light, but I also kind of want to be in the dark. I, I kind of want to be in both places. This is one of the recurring messages throughout the Old Testament. If you're going to follow God, you're going to follow him all the way. Remember that the children of Israel had, they had signed up for this covenant. They had the opportunity to refuse. God set before them the covenant in Deuteronomy, and they said, yes, we will do it. We'll obey it. They reaffirmed it under Joshua. We're going to obey this covenant. We'll take all the, all the curses. We'll take all the blessings. Of course, I think they were thinking mostly of the blessings, not the curses, but both blessings and, and curses accompanied this covenant that they made with God. But yet in practice, 
they didn't really want to just serve God. They, they kind of wanted a foot in both camps. They wanted to have this worship of God. They wanted to bring the God box in when it was time for a battle, and they wanted God to fight their battles for them. But they still also wanted to have some of the pagan deities just in case God didn't do their will. They wanted to make sure they still had some of the local pagan deities like Baal and Asherah and some of these other ones just in case. God was drawing a, a line here and he's saying, I'm not going to have Dagon here in front of me. And he puts Dagon down on his face. You shall have no other gods before me. There is an incompatibility between light and and darkness. Secondly, it was the affliction that brought about desperation to find a remedy. Affliction brought about desperation to find a remedy. They got a council together. You can just imagine all these warlords of the Philistines all sitting in one room and they said, well, we'll just send it to the next city. And then they sent it to the next city and tragedy happened. And then he tried, they were doing everything they could to fix the problem. And finally, they just said, we got to get this thing out of here. They, they were desperate because of the situation they found them in and they, they were under all of this affliction. Sometimes God permits and allows affliction. There is, there is an affliction of sin in our world and the curse of sin. Uh, ultimately, the reason bad things happen is because of sin in this world. God created the world good. At the end of each day of creation, he said, it's good, it's good, it's good. And, and, it's, and then after mankind sins, we, we, we get into all this destruction and mess and chaos and death and disease. And, and this curse of sin comes on the world. And, and that curse of sin, that affliction is meant to drive us to seek a remedy. But what does mankind do most of the time? We seek to find ways to avoid the affliction without running to God's remedy. Consider the words of Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love. As Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a, burnt, and, a, and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be even named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness or foolish talking or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator or unclean person or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. This is why we must take a stand against sin. This is why we have to preach against sin and call sin, sin. Because if we don't call things sin that are sin, sinners won't seek a remedy. They won't understand their fallen condition. They'll just think they're fine. They'll think everything's okay. And, and I know that there's people out there that'll say, Oh, Jeff, we should only talk about the love of God. We should only talk about His love. We shouldn't talk about sin. Because love makes people feel good and, and preaching against sin makes people feel bad. But, but I want to say to you honestly, if we, if we take that approach, we would love people right into hell. Because they would not understand their fallen condition before God, their sinful condition before God. They wouldn't understand, they wouldn't feel the weight of God's affliction to drive them to a remedy. When we preach against sin, it in fact magnifies the love of God. Consider what the scripture says. Here is the love of God made manifest or made known in that while we were yet sinners, Christ did what? Christ died for us while we were sinners. If we understand the magnitude of our sin and our, and our, our, our falling short before God, it magnifies his love that he has paid the price for our sins. That he's loved us that much that he sent Jesus to take our place on the cross so that we might be reconciled to God. 
And what happens in a culture where there's, there's no punishment for sin, a lawless culture? And the scriptures say that in the end times, things will be lawless. One of the characteristics of Antichrist is that he's a lawless one. And when there's no law, there's no punishment. When there's no punishment, there's no, there's no consequence. And when people live without consequence, they, they, they're just heaping up and piling up sins, not realizing that they're offending God and harming themselves and harming others. The affliction, even the, the light in the darkness. Uh, uh, when you turn a light on, when people's eyes are used to it being dark, and, and surely you've, you've walked from the outside into a dark room and you could hardly see anything, but you've probably also walked from a dark room, maybe out of your garage on a, on a bright day, and, and the, uh, the sun was so bright it, it kind of hurt your eyes. Or when you were a child and, and your mom wanted to wake you up, she'd flip the lights on in your room. And, and what was your reaction? Oh, thank you, Mother. I wanted to wake up, and I really appreciate you blasting that light right in my eye. Is that what you said? No. What was your first reaction? Get the blankets. Get the pillow. Cover. And when we preach against sin and we preach uh, the holiness and love of God and, and, the, and the, uh, God's affliction and, and sin and wrath, what are people going to do? At first, they say, no, we don't want to hear that. We, we, they cover themselves. But what are they doing? They're staying in darkness. They're staying in their fallen condition. But as your eyes adjust to the light, what happens? You begin to see things more clearly. The affliction is essential to drive us toward the remedy. And that remedy is Jesus. The scripture says, continuing in Ephesians chapter 5, For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. The fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and truth and righteousness and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship or partnership with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. So there's a theme we can see running through the Old Testament. It runs right through the book of Samuel, that there's this incompatibility. You can't serve God and, and idols at the same time. There's an incompatibility with light and darkness. And through the judges and Samuel and other places in the Old Testament, we see that the affliction that is brought on by God is brought on for the purpose of bringing us to seek a remedy. And in the New Testament, and certainly in the Old, through prophecy, we see that the ultimate remedy for that affliction is Jesus. He took the affliction on the cross, the weight of our sin. When you read through the Old Testament and you see the punishments of God on sin, it's intended by those authors that you and I would feel the weight of those punishments. That we would say, oh, what a terrible thing. People were on the outside of the ark and they're banging on the doors saying, let me in. Uh, when the fire and brimstone's falling on Sodom and Gomorrah, you're supposed to read that and feel the weight and the gravity of that moment that people were perishing because of sin and God's judgment amongst them. You're supposed to feel that. It's not something we should just pass over. Because then it makes us realize that when Christ was on the cross, that's the kind of punishment that he was facing for my sin and yours. That he was facing the wrath of God. He was paying the penalty for my sin and yours. And what an appreciation now that gives us. It magnifies his love because when you reduce sin, you also reduce redemption. When you say sin is a big deal, God's holiness is a big deal, now our redemption is also a big deal and what God has accomplished is a big deal. Jesus is the remedy. The affliction is intended to drive people to Jesus. Think about the prodigal son as we close. The prodigal son, he says, I don't want it. Uh, Dad, just give me the money and I'm getting out of here. I don't want to live under your authority. I don't want to live under your rules anymore. I'm going to go. And what does he do? He squanders everything. And where does he find himself? In a pig pen. Remember the story? Does the father send him a care package? Why not? Because the father knows he's got to feel the weight of his decisions. He's got to feel the weight of this. And eventually what happens? He's in the pig pen and he comes to his senses and he says, even the servants in my father's house have a better deal than this. And he experiences repentance. Listen, I, I wish I could shield everybody from, from God's wrath. I can't. What I have to do is prepare people. 
You will either face God's wrath or you will come behind Jesus because Jesus has faced God's wrath in your place. And so my encouragement is come under Jesus' covenant because he's already borne the wrath for us. Father, I pray that as we read these stories in the book of Samuel, you would just help us to, to see how holy you are and how, how white hot your anger is against sin and idolatry. I pray that we would take it seriously in our own lives and that, and that we would with great compassion and grace and mercy reach out to those who are lost and, the, and, and those who are living lives of sin and with no awareness that they're offending you. Lord, help us to reach out to them with the love of Christ that, 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 the, that your love would be magnified because while we were yet sinners, you died for us. You loved us that much. Lord, we thank you for our great salvation. Help us as we study through the word to make right application. And I pray that we've done that this morning. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.